Trinity students and welcome to this wild, wonderful world virtual field trip. You are joining us in South Africa today for what is going to be a very exciting safari in the bush. Wild Wonderful World is an organization dedicated to protecting wildlife in Africa and we hope you'll join us in advocating for wildlife too. My name is Michelle and my name is Grant and we are both field guides so it is our job to take people out into the wilderness and show them the wonders of the wild. So today we'll be taking you out on a bushwalk where we'll be having a look at some of the smaller things that you might find out in the wilderness. Today we're going to take you on a journey from one mighty continent to another, from America to Africa. From the United States of America, you cross the Atlantic Ocean to reach Africa, and then to find South Africa, you've got to travel all the way down to the south. Can you see it there? The very southern tip. Now, South Africa is surrounded by ocean on its southern parts, the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean. Now, we are sitting in the Limpopo region, which is found in the northeast corner of Africa, right there where the elephant is. Water holes like these are a lifeline in the bush. Lots of animals come down to drink here. And of course, you've got your water species like crocodiles and hippos that are found living inside them. Elephants particularly like to come down to the water holes to drink and are sometimes even seen swimming in the water on a very hot day. Elephants are a very exciting animal to see on safari and as the world's largest land mammal, they truly are enormous. Now, when they're not swimming, they're eating, and a big male elephant can eat up to 350 kilograms of food per day. Now, that's a lot. Walking along the edge of a waterhole can be a very good place to look for tracks and signs of animals, and sometimes even the animals themselves. This was a very large pride of lions that we found drinking at a waterhole one day. It's not very often you see a pride of lions this big. You can imagine, that's a lot of water they're lapping up. If you listen very carefully, you can hear them lapping. Water isn't only an important lifeline for animals in terms of them drinking it, but it is a lifeline for the plants and the trees that grow alongside it. This is important for animals such as leopard, who like to move in thicker, denser areas because they can move from one area to the next without being detected. Leopards have a very special coat with interesting markings. We call these rosettes, and the rosettes help the leopard to camouflage into the bush, allowing them to rest peacefully on a very hot day like this leopard here. Back on the trail now, and we're looking for some exciting things to show you. So if you have a look at this very thorny bush over here and these tiny little leaves that it's got, these leaves are full of nutrients. So giraffes and all other sorts of antelope species will like to eat these leaves. So obviously the tree needs to protect itself. And to do that, he's got these massive, really sharp thorns. Here behind me is a massive knobthorn tree. Giraffes love feeding on these trees with their sweet leaves. And if you look up near the top, you can see a big, big nest made out of sticks. This is the nest of a Wahlberg's eagle one of the eagles that migrate here every year. Now lots of birds use trees to build their nests and here is a paradise flycatcher sitting on her nest. Can you see all the little lichens she's used to help camouflage the nest into the tree? They're very clever. As you can see, different birds have different nests from the big stick nest of the Wahlbergs to this cup nest of the paradise flycatcher. Can you explore in your neighbourhood and see what different shapes of nests there are? I bet you could. As we walk through the bush and explore the different things there are to see, we're also looking for the smaller creatures, like this one here. 
He has a beautiful golden orbweb spider. Busy working on her nest. And rebuilding her web which she uses to live in. And she uses it to catch her food. Look at those bright colours. We've seen the homes of birds and spiders, but what about the bigger animals? Well, let's see what we can find. So, so come and have a look over here how this animal has dug a hole straight into the termite mound here to make its home. So this burrow was made by an aardvark. And he's just dug with his very powerful claws straight into this very hard ground. And inside there he'll live for a few days or weeks at a time. And they move from one burrow to the next. So once the aardvark is finished with that burrow, he'll move out of there and, and find another burrow somewhere, but he leaves this hole in the ground, and that hole in the ground will be used by other animals, sometimes wild dogs, um, which we're hoping to find as well for you. They'll come and use these burrows as dens when they're going to have their pups, um, and lots of different things from bats to insects to snakes and even some birds will use the burrow afterwards to make their home in as well. Hyenas are another type of animal that will use burrows like these to have their cubs in. Did you know that hyenas are matriarchal? Which means that the strongest, wisest female leads the clan. Now when they have cubs, they typically have two at a time. And when they're first born, they're entirely black, resembling little bears, just like these two here. It's only at about three months when the hyena's spots start to appear but they'll remain at the den site for up to a year before they'll start joining some of the adults out scavenging and hunting for food of their own. Now, hyenas don't have a very good reputation, and for those of you who've seen The Lion King, you know why. But actually, hyenas are incredibly intelligent with an amazing sense of smell, and as you can see at a den here, they're very loving mothers too. So if you have a look down on the ground here in front of me, something has walked along this path and this big footprint in the sand here tells us who it was. So it's quite a big footprint if you look at the size of my hand next to it and you can see that it's got two halves with a split in the middle, one half there and another half there. So this animal was walking over in this direction so this is the front of the foot and this would be the footprint of a big giraffe. So that giraffe track that we saw on the path earlier on when we were walking and just up ahead, we found a small group of them out in this little open area here. There's one over there and there was a few others that have walked down the slope just in front of them. There he is right out in the open with his awesome long neck, his long legs and that swishy tail. Beautiful. The part of taking people out into the bush is for them to be able to experience this. To be, able to, stand, to be able to stand in front of a giraffe like this is a very, very special thing to, to experience. And for us, that's the reason why we want to teach people about wildlife and protecting these areas so that experiences like this will still be there around for our children and our children's children to experience as well. Now one of our jobs at Guides is not just about finding animals, but it's about protecting them. 
And this is called conservation. Conservation is about looking after the homes that the animals live in, as well as the animals themselves, and to stop people from poaching and making sure that these animals are all here for future generations to enjoy as well. One of South Africa's most endangered animals is the rhino. Now this video is of white rhinos and there are poachers who are targeting the rhinos for their horn. That's that long pointy thing on the front of their faces. Now if you have a look at your fingernails, that is exactly the same material as the rhino's horns made out of. So it makes absolutely no sense to poach them. We can be advocates to tell other people not to poach rhinos because their horn is the same as our fingernails. just been walking along game path and we've seen some very very fresh tracks of wild dogs. You can see here we've got the front foot and the back foot and the four toes one two three four and a little back pad. Sometimes if there is um, more clayish ground you can see the claws it's quite sandy here and you can't. They were going that way down the path. Now we don't often get wild dogs in this area so this is a very very exciting thing to see. Um, and they're very fresh tracks. You can see the sharp edges there. We are absolutely going to follow them and see if we can find them for you. Let's go. We're still following these tracks of the wild dogs, but I thought I'd explain quickly how we tell the difference between wild dog tracks and any other tracks. For example, compared to lions and leopards. Now, it all comes down to the shapes of them. If we look at our hands, we've got a pad and then we've got our fingers. Now, cat tracks have three little loops on the bottom of their pads and dogs have two. If you go out in your local bush or if you go down to the river where there's some sand, you can even see that yourself. So let's have a look what that means. Here's my sandy canvas. Let's look at a cat first. A cat has the three loops at the bottom and it comes up and around here with the four toes. One, two, three and four. But a dog only has two loops. One, two and then the four toes. One, two, three, four. Now in our case, we're looking for wild dogs. So we're looking for a track with two loops at the bottom. Now wild dogs are actually a little bit different from the normal domestic dog that you would have at home. Their toes are different. Instead of having four separate toes, interestingly, two of their toes are a little bit, I'll get my rock out my canvas. Two of the toes are a little bit stuck together or fused, we call it. So they're very close together. And then there's another toe there and another toe there. And when we see that, we get very excited because that is a wild dog track. And that is what we are following. So. We're going to continue up here, we're going to follow those wild dog tracks and hopefully we're going to find them for you. We're very excited, we've just glimpsed the wild dogs in the distance so we're going to run back to the car to drive around to see if we can catch up with them. This is our trusty Land Rover Kuhanya. We travelled all over Africa in this Land Rover. Very, very good at helping us find animals. There they are. We're not the only ones that have spotted them. The giraffes have spotted them too. Can you see them? Off they go, they're running through the bush. Now 
wild dogs move extremely quickly. They're one of the most difficult creatures to keep up with when you're driving or walking around. Now, they're not dangerous to man, but they are a predator. Africa's most successful predator at that. It was so exciting to see the wild dogs this morning. And one of the things we absolutely must talk about is their conservation. Now, wild dogs are an incredibly endangered species, and we're very lucky to have Grant Beverly here with us from the Endangered Wildlife Trust to talk a little bit about the conservation of wild dogs in Africa. I'm Grant Beverly, and I'm a conservationist at the Endangered Wildlife Trust's Carnivore Conservation Program. I coordinate the protection of South Africa's second most endangered carnivore in the Greater Kruger National Park area. African wild dogs are endangered, which means they are at risk of going extinct in the wild. If they go extinct, that means that there are no more individuals left on the planet and they'll be lost forever. The African wild dog is endangered mainly because of human population growth that results in habitat fragmentation, which means the areas that used to be available for wild dogs to live in, their homes, have become smaller and smaller. That means that there's no longer space for wild dogs to live in. Now the wild dogs don't know which areas they can and they cannot go, which means sometimes they find themselves in the dangerous position of being on farmland. They're hunting like they do naturally, but hunting those animals on farmland may be goats and sheep, which makes farmers very cross. We therefore need to monitor the position of wild dog to keep them safe from persecution. We use tracking collars to monitor the movement of wild dogs. This is because wild dogs cover incredibly large areas. So how do these tracking collars work? The tracking collars have got a built-in GPS, which shows us where the wild dogs are, which connects them to a satellite so we can monitor their daily movements and help prevent any threats that they may be facing. Wild dogs really are incredible animals. It's not just how successful at hunting they are, but it's their pack mentality. The way that they all help each other, hunt together, and even help raise the pups together. Now it's our job to help conserve wild dogs for future generations. And in doing so, we help maintain the balance of the bush so that everything is in equilibrium. From the predators, to the prey, to the plants. It's all a balance, and that's what conservation is about. Right, well it's been a fantastic morning and I hope you enjoyed coming out with us. Such a great turnout that we managed to find some giraffes and some lovely wild dogs for you. And we hope that you get to join us again one day. Absolutely. Thanks again and just remember that every single one of you at home can be an advocate for wildlife. And if you ever have any questions then we are just a short email away and we would love to help you to connect with wildlife in Africa. Thanks everyone. Bye.